Good morning, and thanks for tuning in to K-Talk AM 6.30. It is a beautiful Wednesday morning. Nice crisp mornings. It's crazy. Love it. So nice. I was up at 6 o'clock today, and I'm just like the sunlight popping in through the window. I love waking up by the sunlight. That's the only way to wake up. It's the best. Actually, I I woke up all weekend by the sunlight Yeah. up in Idaho. I'm I'm jealous. I was at the uh, Granite Creek Guest Ranch. It used to be a, a working ranch um, guest experience where you actually go on cattle drives and stuff like that. And it's actually converted into more of a bed and breakfast. Okay. Um, and, and it was, oh my gosh. I'm losing the words that so I need to how say. how many people does it sleep out there? How, how big so they it? have all these little cabins that are, most of the cabins are like 100 years old. Oh, yeah. And they've been moved from other homesteads. Okay. So this is an original relocated. homestead. And I don't know how this guy homesteaded because to be able to do it, you had to be there for five years um, as a homesteader so that you could actually have the property. You had to qualify on on the old homesteading process. And so he was living during the winters in four to six feet of snow for five years. That's got to be tough. The guy that had the land before him defaulted on it because he left. He's like, I can't do this. It was too hard. (laughs) So he toughed it out. So he toughed it out and ended up getting it. But... uh, it's been in this family's uh, ownership forever. Well, mm-hmm. since, since they, they get, took it over, they homestead, yeah. but uh, built his own little cabin. They they're, they've acquired more land and brought those cabins into this location. They've got their own natural spring. They've got their own fishing pond. See, I think where that would be stocked it. I think that would be the ideal kind of prepper location. Is you live and work at a bed and breakfast in the middle of the mountains. And you don't have to go anywhere. You're except for the you're winter just, part. Except for the winter part. Six feet obviously. of snow. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot to deal with. Cabin fever. Absolutely. You need a you need like an underground bunker system with like really you, cool. You need like a, snow a, a hobbit hole. Snow you need cap. a yeah, oh, there, yeah. There you go. Yeah, get a hobbit hole, build build a you know a hillside uh, home and then have a snow cat so you there can you go. get around to uh, get to town and so forth. Or one of those industrial snow blowers that they uh, they use on the highways oh, yeah, up in yeah, yeah. Uh, you know Aspen or up in Park City. Park City's here. Fairview, Aspen's in Colorado. Fairview well. top. There you go. So, but yeah, it was. They have horseback riding. They have you know your breakfast is taken care of. Your lunch and dinners on your own. Um, actually, Eric with K Talk was there too, and uh, I smoked him three times in chess. I just want everyone to know that. <laughs> um, it was awesome. He's good. But I am better. I need. I just. <laughs> <laughs> you're a strategist, so I, you're the right man. I'm like for the eight job. moves ahead of myself. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, uh, if I go over here, what's gonna happen? Oh, there goes my queen. But yeah, it was so much fun. We. It fun. was. My wife and I needed that vacation so bad, and so we booked it at the time of PrepperCon. Went up. Um, it's a five star review place. Like it. It's totally. y- you're. You're in a slice of history, enjoying. The mountains. Um, it's right. You've got an overlook of the, of the Grand Tetons. Um, mm-hmm. They've got a mule you can go ride. That's the the, the four by four oh, right. mule. Not so it's seat kind of six. Mule. Yeah, side by sides. Um, Not an seat six. Mule. They'll take you up on on rides on that. You've got horseback riding. You can take up. But I mean, there's there's an active bear population there. There's an active moose population there. I missed the moose. I went to bed too early, and I got a text like 30 minutes after I was asleep. Hey, there's a moose right outside right now. And I'm like, no. So in other words, keep track of your children while you're there, right? Absolutely. <laughs> but it was it was awesome. Amazing hospitality. You can check it out. Um, Granite Creek Guest Lodge or Guest Ranch. Sorry, Ranch, Granite yeah. Creek Guest Ranch. If you, Dot com. If you Google it, um, you'll find their Airbnb. Um, or you can just type in GraniteCreekGuestRanch.com and call them to see what their availability is. But they, they're right off the Snake River, which is one of my favorite rivers. They're minutes from from uh, Palisade Reservoir. A lot of great mm-hmm. fishing over there. There's, uh, oh, man, I just love it. Swan Valley. It's beautiful. Square ice cream. I love square ice cream cones. I don't know why square is better. But <laughs> it, it was just fantastic. So this hour is actually brought to you by Survival Medical. Um, these guys are amazing. They actually, um, 20 year shelf life on medical products. So when you think about preparedness, you think about getting all the stuff you need, a lot of people will spend you know, five, six hundred bucks on a really good medical kit. In 18 months, most of it's mm-hmm. expired. As far as like your your gels, right. your burn Still gels. Usable, your but usable, not. but expired. Um, 
your band-aids start losing their adhesion. Mm-hmm. Um, the nice thing about this one is, is if you're, you've got your food storage, you've got everything else, you just buy this. It um, and it's not just the big, huge kit. It's everything. I mean, I've got the ultralight backpacker kit in my go bag. I've got um, the Voyager kit in my bug out bag, my, mm-hmm. my 96 hour kit, if you will, or for those of you who don't prep that much, maybe your 72 hour kit. Um, but I love, I love their product. I love the way they do things. Um, I think it's turning the entire industry on their ear and changing how things are done. And they're actually launching a marine line right now. So that. for uh, for all of you coastal boat have fun kind of people, as well as the Utah Lake and Jordan L mm-hmm. kind of guys, you know, something that take take with you, leave it in the boat. Leave it, just leave it there. Yep. Yeah. So you don't have to pack there. it in and pack it out every time. Um, and you'll probably have that kit longer than you'll have your boat. Probably, yeah, unless you leave it in your boat when you sell your boat. True, but true. <laughs> So but, they're, uh, they're sponsoring yeah. the show. We're so appreciative of them. And it, John will be on next week with us as well. And we're going to continue our awesome Sa- sanitation sanitation discussion that it, we didn't really finish last time. We barely scratched the surface last time. It was a lot of fun, especially getting the texts from John while we're sitting here talking about the feces and poo. And poo. <laughs> he, I think we said that that's word a, about a thousand times. That's, that's that uh, John's favorite word. So, so. I'll, I'll just say it again. Feces. There we go. He's, he's listening so, now. He can giggle like a little schoolboy. So we, we have a fun, fun day ahead of us. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit. Of, for the first segment, we're going to talk about liberties, about um, our, our rights, about freedom, what that really means. Um, second segment, we're going to jump into pandemics. Mm-hmm. Dun, dun, dun. Kind of continuing along the same line as our sanitation theme, which will continue next week as well. I really, you know, you know me. I like to get in the details. I love talking about the nitty-gritty and, and really how to get prepared. Uh, and a lot of that is about knowledge so well, we're going to focus exactly. a lot of that today about pandemics we have a great guest coming up after the first break uh, his name is kenneth mcclelland he wrote the book the pandemic preparedness guide and uh, we'll have him on and we'll talk pandemics absolutely and, and pandemic if you want to pop in with your two cents throughout the show give us a call the number here is 801-254-5855 we love having our callers call in um, with that i want to talk about this this movement liberty rising um, the Bundys, the Lavoie Finnicum and his family, um, the, the, I just totally lost their name, the other rancher family that just lost their freedom. Um, totally losing it, but here, here's the thing. We have, uh, we have a special opportunity coming up in, in July, July 30th. They're going to be doing a really amazing roundtable speaking presentation. It's, it's actually going to be done. Um, it's called Preserving, Protecting, and Defending the Constitution, Lest We Lose the Republic. All the, all the proceeds go to uh, support the Lavoie Finnecom family. Um, they lost their income when they lost their father. And uh, mm-hmm. the speakers actually include some pretty, really amazing people. Uh, ben McClintock, Chief Investigative Reporter and Co-Founder of Defending Utah. Um, Angus McIntosh, I love that name, Angus. Angus. Good Scottish name. Must be a good brogue. Uh, doctorate graduate in range science and agricultural economics from New Mexico State University. Uh, Mark Hare, senior co-founder of nonprofit education institution, the Center for Self Governance. Uh, Garrett Smith, who's an attorney, he's also on the uh, Liberty lineup. Mm-hmm. I believe every Monday. Same with Ben. Great show. Um, and then Lavoie Finnicum's daughters, uh, Brittany Beck and Tara Tenney. They're both going to be talking, as well as Lavoie Finnicum's wife, um, Jeanette Finnicum. So we've got a really good opportunity there. Uh, let's focus on our liberties. You know, we here at Gay Talk Radio and uh, at PrepperCon, it's all about personal liberties. You know, this mm-hmm. country was founded on the idea that we have the ability to govern ourselves. We have the ability to take care of ourselves. And, you know, before, I, before we move on, um, uh, go to the Defending Utah uh, Facebook page or defendingutah.org, and you can find the link to where you can get tickets for this event. Yeah, the tickets are 15 bucks uh, if you buy them online early. If you don't buy them online, you'll end up buying them at the door for 20 bucks. Uh, but it's Which Saturday, all July the better, 30th. Because it all goes to the family. So. Yep. Uh, it's from 6 to 10 p.m., and it's going to be at the 748 North, 1340 West, or in Utah. And that's actually at the, uh, the Boy Scout. Yeah, the office. BSA building, Boy mm-hmm. Scouts of America, um, the Salt Lake. Or- Orem? It is an Orm. Yeah, Orm. 800, 800 so it's, Orm. Orm. it's the Utah County yes. office. Right down in my neck of the woods. So I will be there. You'll be there. I'll be driving all the way down for it. You'll see the PrepperCon truck and, and Forerunner out there. But uh, 
you know, there's not enough going on to to defend our constitutional rights. I think that that's one of the biggest things in prepping that mm-hmm. that I love is people are really focusing on self reliance and liberty. Mm-hmm. You know, two things I'm passionate about: liberty being let's focus on our constitutional rights. Let's focus on why this country was created to be the way it is. Why we have a constitution. Why it was so necessary. I mean, we're under the control of, of a foreign government. Um, I can say that now because they don't no longer here. But uh, at the time, it, there was no representation. We were being taxed beyond belief. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, not as much as we're taxed today. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And only 3% of the country at the time was pushing for this revolution. 3% actually stood up and, and fought in the revolution. That's what blows me away, 3%. Yeah. So what are we doing? Wh- who, who is the 3% today? Um, stand up, make a stand, do something right, help educate your neighbors, help educate your community, um, understand what their rights are, understand what, what liberty really means. Now, understand this is not about anarchy. No, 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 no. Not at all. It is, we, and where do I start with this? We need a some form of government, and that's what the Constitution is, a very basic, that where the people govern the government, and the government takes care of this, the larger picture items like the military, and you know, sure, throw roads in there and so forth. But uh, that is what we need to get back to. Yep. Will it ever happen? Yeah, we can all argue that, but that's not what our show is about. I'm hoping it is. Yeah. I, I think what, what we're trying to get to is, is is we need to preserve America. We need to do the right thing. Um, I see so often people are like, well, the politically correct thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, like this whole guerrilla s- situation. Yeah. You know, everyone's flying off the handle over a gorilla and a child, but they're not flying off the handle about their liberties. Mm-hmm. They're not flying off the handle when a bill gets passed that, that makes it harder for your family to, to be your family anymore. Or they're trying to take rights away from, you know, different government organizations are trying to take the, the parents' rights away and say that the children belong to the government. Well, that's not the case. The government belongs to the people. We need to make sure we're voting. We need to make sure we're active in, in the polls. We need to make sure we're active in, in Every town hall. Yeah, the word that sticks out to me is do. What are we going to do about it? Yep. Um, yeah, we're here talking about it. Is that actually going to result in any in anything? It, you know, what are we doing? Are we physically doing something? Are we talking? Are we just l- clicking the like button? Are we just sh- sharing posts? I mean, that all helps to raise awareness. But are we reaching out to those who really do not understand? Uh, and that's what really our mission is, is to find those people who... Uh, don't know about prepping, who don't know about preparedness, who really don't have that larger picture, which I wasn't included in, in that, you know, less than a decade ago. Uh, and I was, and I won't go there, but uh, I woke up, and I know, so I know others can as well. They Absolutely. can get the spirit of it. They can, and, and so they, that's why they need to come to this event, send people to it, uh, sh- share it, get on, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make a post on PrepperCon as well on the Facebook page, and yep. so we, can, we can all share that and get people to this event. It's a highly educational event. I, I think that's why we're, we're helping support this. Um, number one, PrepperCon is about helping the community, helping the family, helping us get more self-reliant. Um, and part of that is standing up for what's, what's right, what you believe is right, what I believe is right, what your convictions are. So be vocal, have fun. Um, we have a great show today. We're really excited. We're going to continue the conversation um, after, the hour, or after the block um, talking about pandemics, talking about what could happen, what has happened in other places, mm-hmm. why, the, you know, why um, Kenneth M- R. McClellan wrote the book he wrote, um, and how that affects us. You know, it's, it's a great day. We, we're so excited to be here. Remember, we are sponsored this hour by Survival Medical. Um, perfect as we're going about to talk about pandemics. They've got kits for that. <laughs> That's true. They, they do. do. Mm-hmm. We wore them last week. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back after the break. Uh, check out survival-medical.com in the meantime, and uh, we'll be right back with you. All right. Welcome back to PrepperCon Radio on K Talk AM 630. Uh, join us on Facebook. We're about to post a few fun things there. Uh, join us on Twitter at KTKK. And uh, as always, check out k-talk.com we're going to be doing a rebranding relaunch here in september the website's going to be launching here in a few days or a few weeks i guess i think the end of the week is what i think hopefully yeah we've been talking about this for five months now six months now. six months (laughs) probably seven months 
But uh, it looks good. Great new content. We're going to be doing a lot of fun things there. Um, it's not just going to be radio anymore. Um, we're going to have the archives there. We're going to have some content videos. Um, so you'll see some of the PrepperCon content there, uh, some mm-hmm. tutorials, some product reviews, um, all of our radio shows. Uh, you also get to see the Liberty Lineups content. You'll got, you know, you'll get to see um, Defending Utah. Defending Utah. Think. You'll get to see all the different groups that we have here. Um, Paul show in the morning. All all the archives are there. So if you ever want, to, and they're they're currently there on the on the current site as well. But it's going to be easier to find in the future. Um, you'll also get to see all the bios. So you can see what we mm-hmm. look like, us crazy guys. Mm-hmm. Um, you hear our voices all the time, you know. But it's fun to put a face to the name. And, and we do not have radio faces, I must say. Scott and I were t- speaking directly. I don't know about what that us. means. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But radio uh, voice, but not a uh, radio I don't, face. I don't have a radio voice, really. I don't think. But I, I can do a pretty good Alex Jones. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there is a crisis. <laughs> we're uh, we're not going to go into that though. We've we got will, a special we will eventually guest. though. We will eventually. Before we jump into our guest reminder, we are we are being sponsored by survival-medical.com. I would highly check out. I would recommend to everybody check out their Voyager series. Put it in your car. Keep it there always. Um, and then also look at their their cover up kits. Um, as we're as we're about to talk to our new guest, Kenneth R. McClellan. We're going to bring him on the line, but. Uh, Check out survival-medical.com for your first aid. They are the only first aid kit designed for long-term storage, and they're going to be in Sam's Club next month mm-hmm. um, here, here in Utah. So make sure you get out there and support them and get those um, and protect your family. So without further ado, let's, let's bring on our guest. Hello, Ken. Are you there? Yes, good morning. Good morning, and thanks for coming on with us this morning. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and your your listeners. Absolutely. It was nice to talk to you for the first time yesterday. And uh, we have been Facebook friends for a number of months. And uh, when I got a hold of my hands on your book and uh, thought it would, you know, we're talking, been talking about sanitation and uh, in, in, during SHTF during a disaster, which can be extremely difficult. And we wanted to touch on the pandemic side of it. You know, briefly, you know, two segments is really not a whole lot of time to, to get into the subject, but uh, we want to create some awareness. And I guess, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, why you wrote the book. Uh, from what I understand, I guess you're primarily an author. Well, actually, uh, I work for the government, but I'm not in the medical field directly. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was writing a book about, a, it was a historical novel about the 1918 influenza pandemic. And I was fascinated with that. And then I started hearing on radio and other news programs about uh, the bird flu that was going on, going on over in Vietnam and China. And it was just, just all over the place, you know, about 10 years ago. I started paying attention and I thought, you know, I probably should study up on that a little bit and maybe add a few pages on the back of my novel about what's coming. Well, that, that few pages turned into 330 pages and made a mm-hmm. book of its own. Wow, that's and, uh, awesome. Hey, fantastic. Interesting. So what was it that got you really concerned and uh, as you're doing your research for this book uh, that made you want to uh, write the pre- pandemic preparedness guide? Well, the 1918 influenza pandemic was also a bird flu. When I found, you know, when I read that, that, that uh, DNA testing had revealed that, I thought, mm-hmm. you know what, the same thing could happen now. And uh, one of the things I came across in my research was that they said a severe pandemic happens about every 34 to 37 years. Mm-hmm. And they said... We're at the 45-year mark, so they said we're overdue for it. It yeah, just kind of like earthquakes over- and everything else. We're a little overdue for for disasters that we need to be Correct. prepared for. And the way the way things are happening, you know, with you know, like this past year, maybe uh, I'm sure a lot of your listeners were paying attention, but many people weren't. Last year, we had uh, three different strains of bird flu attack our food supply. They said it was the worst assault on our on America's food supply in our history, mm-hmm. and. Uh, 50 million chickens and turkeys destroyed, you know, taken off our tables. And that's right. Goodness knows how many eggs, you know, went along with it. But at any time, that could have, it could have made the species leap from birds to mankind. And that's, you know, that's pretty scary. Mm-hmm. And and I know your your book does outline the different phases, I guess, of a pandemic. Pandemic. But let's go ahead and, and uh, talk about what actually a pandemic is versus an epidemic, uh, and so forth. Okay, an epidemic is something, you know, like a, a flu outbreak at a school or maybe even a, okay. a neighborhood or even a whole city. Mm-hmm. But a pandemic, that's, you know, that's around the world. In other words, it's a global thing. It's going to spread that quickly and that, that broad rather than just localized. Okay. So, and I know that uh, we have seen most of these uh, 
say the like swine flu, the bird flus, and so forth, come out of essentially third world countries, come around the world all the way over to the United States. Correct. China is, is uh, the hotbed for most of the new bird flus that come out, or most of the new flu strains. And uh, throughout history, they've had some problem. And there, there was a, a one province specifically where a lot of it originated, but I'd be darned if I can remember the name of that place. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, which this is, this is kind of concerning because uh, President Obama signed some legislation where we can now send our chickens over to China to have it processed and then sent back mm-hmm. here as nuggets. I heard that. So we don't even know quality. We don't even know Anything. cleanliness. I mean, that, we lose complete control over that. And now we don't know right. what's going to be in our food. If they, right. they, they, they can add additives to it, I'm sure, right? Sure. And not, not only that, but, you know, when you look at how they've handled other things, like, you know, there's been arsenic found in dog food. There's been uh, mm-hmm. tainted baby food. They've sent all kinds of things to the United States that was tainted that weren't even directly food-related, you know, well, weren't always food-related, uh, including medications that were fraudulent. They were a uh, fake medication. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so it's kind of concerning that we're sending chicken over there because, well, let me give you an example. The, uh, the Super Bowl that we just had, you know, the, the last Super Bowl, the uh, FDA was warning that there was, I think, five million pounds of rat meat found that was that was marked as chicken coming from China. So God only knows what kind of quality control they got there. Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, avian flus, bird flus. Why are should we be so concerned about those? I, I know that's uh, one of the main topics throughout your book. You know, the 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 H five N one, H one N one. H seven and nine, all these different bird flus. Why are should we be so concerned, and, and be, why do we need to become uh, knowledgeable about bird flus? I think you know my own personal opinion. I think bird flu is probably going to be the the big virus that that hits everybody. I don't think it'll be Ebola, although Ebola was very concerning. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be Zika or dengue fever or anything like that. And again, this is just my opinion mm-hmm. from what I've read. But I believe it's going to be bird flu because we have such an interaction with the bird species. You know, and I'm talking primarily chickens, you know, but mm-hmm. okay. uh, and the, the fact that uh, anybody on a farm, well, I can, let, let me back up a little bit. On third world countries, their farms are a lot of backyard farms. This, you know, this includes Mexico even. They have little backyard farms, and uh, when their chickens are sick, you know, you know, they get the snotty nose and stuff like that. Some of the mm-hmm. owners will actually clean the noses of the thing with their mouth, you know, and then they'll spit it out. But what? Yeah. I've actually seen videos about that. That's <laughs> disgusting. Yeah. It's pretty pretty gross, but all it takes is for one person to get that mm-hmm. and uh, they can, you know, easily start the pandemic. And then we have to be concerned with how quickly uh, uh, people travel from point A to point B. Right. So they have much more contact with the birds themselves because they're, they're do-it-yourselfers. They're, they're homesteaders. They, they have their own. They're more self-sufficient, self-reliant over there because... Of, you know, they have chickens in their backyard, obviously. Sure. Well, another thing that, that, that happens, or that has happened, and I'm sure it happens, it's going to happen again. Um, the government, you know, let's say Thailand or wherever, let's say they have a big bird flu problem. They tell all these backyard farmers, hey, uh, you got to destroy your chickens. Mm-hmm. That may be the only means of food or their only means of livelihood. So they haven't been uh, quite willing to, to kill their birds because the government doesn't have the right. money to reimburse them. Right. So what they've been doing is they've been selling the tainted meat or eating it, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it's it's just a, a recipe for disaster. Okay. Yeah. No. I, I, absolutely. Um, so the I guess the bird flu is essentially an influenza. It's just like a, a common flu that we we get here. We have our flu seasons every year. Uh, there really isn't I guess much difference in how it's transmitted or really what that virus is, other than. You know, maybe it's, it's obviously worse than most of our flus that we see. Is that correct? Oh, that's right. But it, it used to be in the past, up until the past uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, birds would get bird flu, and it generally didn't harm them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that started about 10 years ago. The bird flu started killing the animals, and that didn't used to happen. They used to have a resilience uh, mm-hmm. to the, the influenza. But uh, but now, you know, it's, it's so strong that it's killing the, the birds themselves. And... Uh, and, you know, and it's not just birds that get bird flu. You know, I'm, I know you've heard of swine flu, but they also have feline flu, and they found feline flu in dolphins. I don't know how that works out, but oh you know, all kinds of animals get you know get influenza. Yeah. Well, you've seen those videos online over the cat and the dolphin kissing, right? I guess that's probably where. <laughs> so then, what? That dolphin goes out into the wild and kisses all the other dolphins. That little slut passes. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, uh, you know, you're talking about this influenza of, of uh, 1918. Um, and I believe that we can learn from history is how we prepare for the future. So tell us a little bit more about this influenza of, of 1918. And, and that's obviously going to happen again. We're beyond, uh, you know, our 39 years when, when we typically have a, a pandemic of some sort. Uh, what, what should we be looking for? Uh, that would that would be mirror or similar or rhyme to the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic. Um, if you're asking what it's going to look like or what it might look like, yeah, what, what it might look like or or what do you think it's going to come from? Um, what we should be, uh, what can we learn from that pandemic then that we can apply now? Well, the one thing that, you know, that sticks out with me was how easily it, it readily it spread. Okay. I mean, it, it just, you know, it just spread from person to person so badly that that uh, cities would outlaw gatherings. You know, they, they said no more football games, mm-hmm. no more bond release, you know, during World War One. No more going to bond school. Release, right. Everything, right well, everything was just canceled. And, uh, you know, and then again, this is the cities that made that proclamation. You know, some of them didn't, and it cost them dearly. Mm-hmm. But, what they started practicing was when they did get together was social distancing, and that's something that we need to remember okay. and employ ourselves if okay, that ever happened. What's your name? So social distance is essential. Essentially, if you and I were talking, we would keep at least a four foot distance between us. Okay. Because while we're talking, you know, you've talked to people, and it's like, man, they're spitting all over your clothes. And, mm-hmm. you know, that four foot distance, you're less likely to, uh, you know, to encounter their spittle. But uh, the other thing was that they they wore masks, mm-hmm. and that's something that I imagine is going to be. You know, in some cities back then, required. I imagine that's going to be required now uh, that people would wear some kind of a mask if they have to be outside. Yeah. Now, I was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I was, uh, you know, reading in your book about this 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 1918 pandemic. Uh, I guess it started in the military um, at a particular military base, and it spread so quickly. I mean, within days, um, I was reading some of your totals. One day, 1,500 people would have. Would would ha- would be diagnosed with the flu, and then the next day, a hundred some odd people would would die, and then it would just multiply from there. <clears throat> um, I guess that's what you were saying when when you first mentioned how quickly it it uh, gets transmitted, and how we uh, need to practice this social distancing because obviously you know touchy feely is is you know I I love to go up put my 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 shoulder my hand on Scott's shoulder and you know give him a hug and and you know is that kind of stuff that we need to need to limit obviously when that when that becomes apparent but i guess we can limit uh, or or look forward to keeping uh, a distance from people and uh, is that something we need to start practicing now i guess is what i'm trying to say well it's not a bad idea you know especially if, if something starts you know no matter what that virus happens to be um, if something starts, you're going to want to practice that social distancing, and Scott will want to practice it just as much as you. So mm-hmm. I don't think there'll be any hurt feelings, and <laughs> it, it could do nothing more than you know uh, give you a longer life, absolutely, or give you more security mm-hmm. towards that. We actually but, have a uh, caller that that would like to talk to us about uh, one of the different types of uh, I guess viruses that's going around. Let me bring him on the line real please, quick. Please and, do. And uh, okay. hey, caller, are you there? Yeah, a couple of things previous book my grandmother had smallpox when she was like four five you know and her sister who was younger than well no i guess she was probably six and her sister that was younger than her hitched up the wagon you know and took him to the neighbors i don't know how she even got the harnesses on the horses but anyway she's like five and i guess my grandmother might have been about eight but when they went into the neighbors who were a couple of miles away they, uh, the neighbors just backed out of their house when they seen these kids come in, you know, because my grandmother had smallpox. Yeah. But anyway, the Spanish flu, uh, oh, I can tell you a story about that. My grandmother, same grandmother had smallpox, you know, she'd been married, she got married and everything. She, she was pregnant and her cousin was pregnant and they went up to see her husband, my, her cousin's husband on a wagon and my grandfather took him up there to the hospital on 21st South, the old county hospital. It's not there anymore. The county building's there now. But anyway, they went and uh, they says uh, she was really she was really worried about her husband. He was a World War One. He came home with Spanish flu. And he's in the hospital. And my grandfather says, uh, 
Don't you? Instead to my grandmother, don't you go in to the hospital. Stay out on the was, or mm -hmm. you stay on the What's buggy. You know. Anyway, uh, my grandmother's cousin. She was pregnant too, and she went in there, and her boy, her husband was sick. You know, laying no. there with a the Spanish flu. No, he's, he's, he's actually yeah. an author. Mm -hmm. um, he, yeah. he does work for the government, but he he does. But he he actually writes a lot of books no, on the side. Go ahead, for, keep going. For fun. Anyway, he uh, <laughs> uh, he got better, and his wife yeah, died. Yeah. She was pregnant, you know, and she died. She mm -hmm. got and she died. Now in San Francisco, there were seven people waiting for the trolley car in 1918, and seven of them died of uh, you know pulmonary edema, where they mm -hmm. were bleed hemorrhaging in the lungs, you know. Uh, they drowned. Yeah, and you, you bring up a great point because it's not just obviously these bird flus we have to worry about. There's, there's a, you know, well, the yeah, there's a bird flu called psittacosis. If you've got parrots or parakeets mm -hmm. in your house, you can get psittacosis or you have chickens. That's a pretty rough disease. I think it's curable. It's either a protozoa mm -hmm. or a, uh, yeah, you know, as you get into spirochete that burrows into you, you yeah. know. Yep. Yeah, as you I'm get into Ken's book, he, he really gets into depth on, on how, how, how all of these, they propagate, how they move around, and really yeah. gets into detail. And, and I the think the, one, the key is education. The new one out of the Middle East is leishmaniasis. That's like Hansen's disease, leprosy. You can, you know, you get these lesions on mm -hmm. your face, and your nose will rot off. You get it inside the roof of your mouth. You can get it on your hands, your arms. You can get and we're it actually everywhere. having to, we're going to run into a break right now. We'll be right back Thanks for your call. Uh, with Ken. Thanks for your call. Uh, okay. We'll talk more about pandemics and, uh, and how to prepare. What's going on and how to be prepared for those things. Hang we're on. brought to you by survival-medical.com. You're going to need a cover-up kit right away if yes. the pandemic hits. So go ahead and get those online, survival-medical.com. Everything you need to, uh, to start preparing now. Those bars on the hey, thanks for hanging with us through the break. You're listening to PrepperCon Radio on AM 630 KTalk. Follow us on Twitter at KTKK. Well, I guess the at symbol KTKK. Facebook, we're KTalk Utah. And uh, watch the website. We're going to be making some changes next to the end of the week. Uh, Pretty exciting. Yeah, definitely very cool. Well, pretty and stoked. if you happen to be hearing something that sounds like an earthquake in the background... Our, the roof is being redone here at K Talk in this entire uh, building, and so and apparently they're working directly here. over us today. Right now, they are directly over the top of us. So if you hear thumping, screw grinding, guns. screw guns, <laughs> some guy yelling curse words, that's them, not us. Whether our show or or whatever else show. Yeah, throughout the day. <laughs> so so getting back into the pandemic, I guess you're still there, Ken. Yes, sir. All right, awesome. Uh, I wanted to jump into, I want to talk a lot about preparedness in this uh, segment, but uh, I saw this uh, article just the other day. Uh, it was on uh, nationalgeographic.com. It's a long-dreaded superbug found in human and animal in U.S. Uh, and apparently this, this, dr this germ, this superbug, is antibiotic-resistant and lacks, I guess, one mutation to be completely resistant to all antibiotics out there, something like that, if I understood that correctly. You're familiar with this story, Ken? Yes. Yeah, uh, what, what it was, it was a 49-year-old <clears throat> woman from Pennsylvania. It didn't say whether she was you know, a, a resident there or, or if she was a recent immigrant or what. All it said was that, you know, what I've read about it, it said mm -hmm. that she went to the, uh, a clinic and they, she had a urinary tract infection. So while they're treating her for that urinary tract infection, they come across this you know, this uh, superbug that they found inside her intestines. And uh, like you said, they found it in pig intestines as well. Now, this isn't, you know, this isn't uncommon over in Europe. I mean, they've seen several cases of it, but this is the first time that it came to the United States where that's been discovered here. So that was a concern. Um, but, you know, we, we've had other superbugs, though, just so people don't think, wow, this is, you know, this is freaky. Mm -hmm. We've had other superbugs, you know, just about every year there's a list of superbugs that they come out with. And in the past, they've always said, well, these superbugs can't even, you know, they're having a hard time fighting it, even with Cipro. Mm -hmm. But with this new one, you know, they, they talk about col uh, colistin. I think that's how it's pronounced. Colistin or colistin. Right, right. I guess that's our, that's our uh, antibiotic of last resort. And they said that this right here typically won't, won't take care of this uh, bacteria that, that she had inside of her. So, you know, there, there's concern about that because if this is the end of the line, I mean, bugs are only going to get worse. You know, these... Uh, bacteria, they just have a way of uh, developing stronger and stronger traits. Mm -hmm. And if we can't stop them, you know, then 
and that's the point I think that the, most of the media is trying to get across is we've got to do some more research and come up with some better better plans for antibiotics because you know uh, these these antibiotic resistant infections. They said CDC says there's about two million people a year that get these infections, mm-hmm. and at least twenty three thousand of them die from it, you know, from the different infections that they get. Mm-hmm. So that number is going to go up if if something like this bacteria that this woman has in her intestines that's going to go up if you know if, if uh, uh, the colistin can't take care of it. Obviously, Cipro wasn't working like it used to either. Yeah, which is 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 really difficult. I mean, it's 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 very very concerning to me. Now, obviously, the the easiest way, the best way, to to take care of these in, these types of uh, uh, pandemics is to prevent them uh, altogether. I mean, to uh, and, and that's what I want to talk about. Is let's talk about prevention. Let's talk about preparation. How we can prepare, uh, because really, what it comes down to is once it's happened, it's too late to prepare for it. Absolutely. So, you know, the, go ahead. Some, the, some things that people can do right now, even, you know, in, even beyond the prepping, is hygiene. Mm-hmm. People don't practice personal hygiene. Then anybody that uses a public restroom, they see people fly in and out of there, and it's like, man, didn't your mom teach you to wash your hands? Mm-hmm. But they do it. You know, they, and I hate leaving a bathroom with, with touching the handle anymore because I know the guy that just left here didn't wash his hands. But you can see how easily bacteria can spread from people to people, you know, because of the lack of personal hygiene. Absolutely. But, uh, but that's something that we should all practice and make sure that we teach our children to, to practice that. You know, when they're, when they're washing their hands, make sure they do it for, you know, five to ten seconds, at least scrubbing them back and forth. And uh, It's anyway, probably but, even a good idea to wash your hands before you use the bathroom and then after as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I wash mine before before and after, sometimes during, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. But, uh, but, you know, the same thing, you know, with, like my grandchildren. When I take my grandson into the bathroom, you know, you know, when they're from the time they're little, I tell them, okay, take this paper towel and use that to turn on, you know, mm-hmm. turn the pot off of the paper towel rather than touching it with your clean hands. But, you know, little things like that right there that we can pass on to the younger generation so it'll become just a force of habit with them. Yeah, now you, ha- you had an example in your book about a lemon wedge. Could you oh, expand yeah. on the lemon wedge a little bit? Yeah, uh, one of the things that I came across was there were, you know, some, I don't know which college, but one of the colleges did a study on on some of the uh, the most bacteria collected on a surface in a typical restaurant. Mm-hmm. And usually it was the lemon. And you think, well, why would the, why the lemon? It's because these lemons are handled by God knows how many people before, mm-hmm. before it gets to you, and they typically don't wash them very well. So they just slice this lemon up, and they'll mm-hmm. put it on the edge of your glass. Well, that bacteria that's on there, you know, since, since I read that, I, I haven't had lemon on my <laughs> drinks. No thank you. Well, and so many people take that lemon from the side of their drink, mm-hmm. they lift it off, they squeeze, squeeze it, it in, yeah. and then they drop it into their drink and mix it in. Mm-hmm. So they're just taking all, everything on the skin mm-hmm. and just... Well, they found a lot of fecal matter on the lemon lemon skin. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. all kinds of stuff on there. I've heard the same thing with onions a lot, a lot of times in, in food. Um, Salad, onions will pull toxins and hold on to those. Is that, is that something you found as well? Uh, yeah, not just not just in a restaurant though. Even in your home, I, I don't know what it is about it. You know, I haven't studied enough about it. You know, but there's something about lemon or uh, onions rather. Once you cut it up, it starts growing bacteria very quickly. I guess mm-hmm. just from stuff floating in the air. I, I don't know, but but it's a, it's like a magnet for a bacteria. So when you when you cut a lemon after you take it out of it, you know, on on a uh, peel it or whatever, um, take that skin off. You start cutting it up. That's when it starts mm-hmm. happening. So you got to use it right away. I, I don't even think they recommend that you keep it in the refrigerator and you want to seal. Just use it and get rid of it. I, yeah. I would have thought the onion would be would repel bacteria and and fungus more more so than any others because of its uh, its uh, content of uh, of uh, what am I thinking of ammonia. The only thing that onions really repel are your wives. Well, wives. <laughs> that sounds like you're a plural polygamist. No, your wives, wives girlfriends, 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 boyfriends, sort of, right. you know, husbands and wives. People people you want to get close to onions will repel them. Nine times out of ten. But you are look if it's a vampire. There you go. That's right. They are good for you. They are good for you. I also wanted to touch on briefly about you, you get into, uh, and we talk about this as well, the just-in-time economics uh, of, of food delivery uh, for grocery stores and so forth and, and how that really affects uh, maybe the spreading of a pandemic or being prepared, I guess, for a, a pandemic in the, with the just-in-time deliveries and so forth. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit? 
Yeah, um, the, the just-in-time economics for people that aren't familiar with it, when you go to the supermarket and you buy a can of soup, all right, when that cash register, you know, the computer in the register is, is deducting that can of soup from their inventories, when it gets down to so many cans, then it automatically places an order with the warehouse that might be 300 miles away. And the warehouse says, all right, we need to send more soup there. Because typically a, a supermarket doesn't have more than three days worth of food. And, and I, I live here in Florida, and whenever there's a threat of a hurricane, even if it's not coming directly towards us, if it's coming close to us, the supermarkets, man, they get wiped out. I mean, the shelves, you know, everything that's edible and some things that people really don't have a use for, they just buy it because it's panic buying. Well, one of the things I found, I, I did a case study in college when I was doing my MBA, and, and one of the things we found is that three-day supply that they say that the, that all the grocery stores have up to, a th- you know, have about a three-day supply. It's not have about, it's have up to. Um, mm-hmm. And that's not for all things. So as you're talking um, about their inventory system, when they get down to so many cans, the reorder limit, you know, it could, it could be two Depends cans the above store. the reorder limit for yep. a month, and they don't order the, the new cans of... of whatever but what happens is is as soon as they get to that limit then they order based on the sales cycle how long it's taking for those those items to come out of inventory so they may not be replenishing replenishing that item to a three-day supply they may be replenishing it to a one-day supply and so a lot of times the food on the shelves depending on the logistical situation number one where is it all being warehoused how far away it is they may only have in most stores like especially in utah they only have about a day and a half of most goods at the location. Um, and that's mm-hmm. scary. That's half of what everyone's talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And so when it comes to preparing for a pandemic, it's just like really preparing for most any other uh, circumstance out there other than maybe a little more specific. And as we're coming up to the end of the show here, let's talk really about maybe what we need to, to have, what supplies we need to have uh, to prepare for a pandemic. Uh, and then uh, what other ways can we prepare ourselves, and then let's get into talking about where we can get your book and so forth. Okay. Um, first of all, as far as the influenza part of it, or the, let's say, viruses in general, whether it's Ebola or whatever, mm-hmm. all right, you want personal masks. If you can get the, you know, the nice half-face mask with the spin-on filters, that's awesome. Make right, sure you right. have some eye protection as well. More of a okay, respirator but, than a, than a right. mask. Okay. Correct, right. Um, but that right there, a lot of people can't afford them. So, you know, like myself, I've got the N95 rated mass. Mm -hmm. The CDC, NIOSH, and uh, agencies across the ocean, they're saying the same thing, that uh, N95, it'll say N-95 on Mm -hmm. it. And uh, what that means is it'll it'll, uh, protect you from 95% of all particulates that are coming through there. The regular kind of mass that you see the guy sweeping the floor with, that's not N95 rated, that's a dust dust, mass. That will not help you, although it will keep spittle from getting on you, I I suppose. But, But you want an N95 rated mask. And you want to be careful to make sure you try them on the, the people that you're wanting, wanting to protect. Because, you know, my wife, she's a small woman, and I tried the small size mask from, uh, you know, some, some of the big-name manufacturers. None of them fit. Mm-hmm. So if, if I waited till the crisis hit and then tried to use it on her, it, it wouldn't have worked. And you probably need so to shave sure. your beards as well. Right, right. You've got, to, you've got to be clean shaven when you wear these masks. You know, I worked at the Space Center for more than two decades, and uh, every year we'd go through, i try on every kind of mask and uh, – you know, the full face, the half face, all kinds of respirators. And, and uh, one thing they stressed was, you know, those little hairs that are growing on your face, you might think it's just a small matter, but, but actually the viruses can actually can get in through yeah. with the mask seal and your, the hairs on your face. Cool. Yep. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why the military uh, pushes everyone to have a clean, shaven face. Mm-hmm. Um, back in, in, in World War II, that's why Adolf Hitler had the little tiny mustache he had because anything larger mm-hmm. – wouldn't fit inside the mask that he had. Mm-hmm. Um, so which, you know, when I learned that, I was like, oh, crap, I love having my beard. What am yeah, I going to do? do too. So i got to carry it. a sharp knife everywhere I go so I can hurry and shave. Oh, and yeah, that wouldn't be any fun. That, that'll suck. All right, so we're, just a few minutes left. What, what else can we do? Obviously, like we were saying, keep your hands clean, uh, especially when you go to public places. What else? You want to, you want to secure masks, uh, nitrile gloves, you know, something that you can use to keep yourself safe. And the reason I say that is because you know, when the stuff hits the fan, it's too late. You're not going mm-hmm. to find any of that stuff. And if you do, you know, it's going to be factory seconds or, stock up on you know, some, some just looking to take your money. You want to stock up on food because if you don't have food, you're not going to be able to get it then. I guarantee you when something happens, no matter what it is, whether it's an EMP, uh, you know, a terrorist attack or whatever, you know, 
if the system shuts down, even momentarily, the supermarkets are going to be wiped out, and the first thing they're going to have to start doing is rationing. You, you also have to stay away from public places in a pandemic. So if you have your food storage, you're going to not have to go out in public. Right, good point. And you can't count on the government being there. If we learned anything from, from Hurricane Katrina, the mm-hmm. aftermath of it, the government couldn't even take care of one small area efficiently. There is no way in God's green earth they're going to be, be able to take care of all the major cities, let alone the small cities and the, you know, the average-sized cities. They just can't do it. Yeah. They're not going to be able to provide food and water for you, any of those things. Now, do you recommend getting like setting up your own like little clean room in your home? So, like, if you do have to go out, you've got like a little barrier where you can take off your sink, oh, yeah. take off your stuff, and clean up before you come back into the house. Or what do you recommend? Uh, something like that, right there. I, I think that it's important that people have the supplies to do that. But you know, I wouldn't go doing that, and, you know, and, until the pandemic is in your area. And if, as long as you keep your household from being out in public. There's no threat to you. If you if you shelter in place, if you can, you know, then the bird flu isn't going to sneak in through your, your back door or something. So, okay, right. you know, the time you would have to set up a clean room is if you have somebody that's sick or suspected of being sick. You know, then you want to do that. And I went ahead and put something in the book about that. And I yep. think I got it from the, the guidelines from the CDC itself on, you know, what okay. they say to do. Well, uh, we're, we are out of time now. Why don't you go ahead and tell everybody where we can get your book, where you can learn more about your uh, about what you do and what you write. Thank you. Um, the, you know, the book is called, again, The Pandemic Preparedness Guide. You can get it through Amazon or you can go to Barnes & Noble and order it or Books a Million or probably most any bookstore. Right. And, uh, you know, and it's it covers more than just viruses. It covers any, you know, uh, irregular situations with our, our system. It talks about government programs that are set in place right now. Right, okay, well, we are out of time. Uh, thanks, for everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Ken, Ken, for coming on with us, and we will catch you guys next week. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thanks. Power swaps and whitens your teeth in five minutes doesn't leave my teeth feeling.